today, turn your Bibles with me to at least yes, chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. And we're going to be looking into um, just this text from verse 1 to 12. Uh, this is titled, uh, Vanity under, sun, under the Sun. And uh, some of the verses will be displayed both in English and in Japanese on the screen. So feel free to follow with me there. Traditionally, uh, Solomon is identified as the writer uh, of Ecclesiastes, although Solomon's name itself does not appear in the entire book. Uh, in, back in chapter 1, verse 1, we see that it simply says, The word of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Uh, king Solomon had more wisdom, uh, more wealth, more women, and was more renowned than anyone else in his time. And here he tells us his observations about life, both from personal study and from personal experience. And so in our passage today, we're going to see the futility of self-indulgence. And number two, we'll see the emptiness of possessions. And number two, we'll see the ultimate gain under the sun. So we see the futility of self-indulgence, the emptiness of possessions, and then lastly, we'll see the ultimate gain under the sun. So follow with me there in verse 1, where it says, uh, I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. Verse 2, I said of laughter it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. Here's a question I have for you before we dive into this text. What do you desire most in life? What is the one thing that you so desire that you can't live without or you fear losing out in life? What is it that you say, if only I can have this, fill in the blank, if only I can have this, fill in the blank, then will my life be happy? If only I can have this, fill in the blank, then will my life be happy, meaningful, and significant? Because Solomon tested his heart with all the pleasures of the world. He said, I said in my heart, come now. I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. If there was anyone who enjoyed the good life, it was Solomon. As a rich king, he enjoyed every pleasurable thing he could find. But he says, behold, this also was vanity. The word vanity there means breath. It means vapor. It means worthless or meaningless. He says in verse 2, uh, I said of laughter, it is mad. <laughs> and of pleasure, what use is it? See, Solomon could enjoy the best amusement parks, more amusing than all the Disneylands of this world, right? He could enjoy the best comedy shows right in the king's courtyard. And yet he says, what use is it? Solomon could not find ultimate joy even in amusement. Then he goes on in verse 3, I search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. What does wine do to you? It stimulates you. Wine cheers you up for a few hours. Uh, Solomon could taste the best wines served to him daily in his courtyard as a king. But the amusements, the comedy shows, the pleasure of wine were all fleeting pleasures as he experimented with them. They could neither fulfill nor satisfy the heart of Solomon who tasted it all. Right? As he indulged himself, he says, My heart is still guiding me wisdom and how to lay hold of folly. 
even as he experimented, his God-given wisdom was still guiding him and he was learning that all of these things never brought the satisfaction that his heart was longing for. Solomon, with all his God-given wisdom, could see how all the pleasures he enjoyed are folly. It means foolish. All kinds of pleasure failed to answer Solomon's deepest hungers. And so, again, here's a question. What is the one thing in life that you think will bring you the ultimate joy? If there is one thing. Perhaps you have more than one thing. What are the things in life that you think, as you look ahead in your life, would bring you the ultimate joy? So is God against all our enjoyments? Absolutely no. All of life is a gift to be enjoyed under the sun. It comes from God. And yet all the pleasures failed to fill the deepest hungers of Solomon's heart who had it all. Notice with me twice in verses 2 and 3, Solomon says, I said in my heart, and verse 3, I searched with all my heart. The heart is the seed of your appetites, the seed of your deepest desires, and the seed of your deepest longings. Solomon searched with all of his heart what was worthwhile doing on the planet or on, on this planet, on the surface of this earth. And he said, Till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of his life. As a wise man, Solomon knew how short life under heaven really is, right? And so here's a question What do you live for during the few days? of your life. If I could borrow the phrase of James in the New Testament quickly here, what is your life like? Is it not like a vapor that appears for a little while and disappears? Like the clouds that you see that appears for a little while and then disappears, it paints a picture of a very vivid short life. And Solomon says, under the heaven your life is just few, your days are few, your days are numbered. So what do you live for? How will you spend the few days of your life on earth? Because I know some people, some young people think, when I was younger, I used to think, I still have my life ahead of myself. I'm young, energetic. I haven't experienced much in life. I haven't suffered much as a younger man back then. I'm 44 now and I've suffered a lot. But it wasn't that way when I was in my 30s even. I thought I had my life ahead of me, right? And yet my friends, even while I'm in Japan, were passing away. I've lost a lot of friends who had gone on to the other side, who were healthier than me. I outlived them with my health issues. Life is short. The few days of your life is short. So how will you spend your few days on earth? See, every good gift under heaven comes down from heaven. God is the source of all good things. Life is a gift from God. But when our hearts turn good gifts, good things, God-given things, into ultimate things, it means if we want that more than God, if we are living for that more than God, they will leave us empty in the end. Today, people hunger for more of everything, right? So in uh, 2022, uh, this year, March, sometime in March, World Happiness Report came out again. In Japan ranked number 54 on the happiness scale, which is still very low among the, the most developed countries of this world. Interesting. This was not so different last time I checked in 2017. See, Solomon did not lack the resources to, persevere, to pursue happiness. There was nothing to hold his heart back from experiencing the pleasures the world had to offer. He searched with all of his heart how to cheer up his body, and yet he concluded this. This also was vanity. Vanity of vanities, as he started in chapter 1. Solomon could find no lasting joy in self-indulgence. And so next we see the emptiness of possessions. 
verse 4. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself, and I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I uh, had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. Verse 8. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces I got singers both men and women and many concubines the delight of the sons of man my goodness do you see Solomon's projects and accomplishments in his lifetime he says verse 4 I made great works he accomplished things he had projects I built houses and planted vineyards for myself I made myself garden and some parks Imagine some of the most beautiful gardens. Solomon could plant them and make that. He made a world for himself. I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees, he says, which could last him a lifetime. I made myself pools, think of swimming pools and jacuzzis, and from which to water the forest and growing trees, even rivers. He could carve it out as a rich, powerful king. Does this sound familiar? Because in Genesis 2.8, God planted a beautiful garden where life was perfect and harmonious. But ever since the fall of man, we had to build houses for our own security because man was kicked out of that beautiful garden. Having a house is a legitimate need. Right? You need a shelter. You need a roof above your head. Right? But many times, right, we look around and think, if only I had a house like my neighbor, if only I had a house like them, that designer house, or that tree LDK, or whatever it is that we want, if only I have that kind of house, then, then only my life will be happy, safe, and secure. So we still believe in these kinds of lies because when we idolize things, even good things like a house, and make them into ultimate things, they cannot deliver the happiness that we were longing for. Because you move in into this new house, a few years later, the roof starts to leak. Now, you're no longer ha as happy as you used to be. Maybe it was an earthquake-prone area and you didn't know. Maybe it was a flooded area. Maybe it was lower, right? Uh, not so high from sea level and then floods came and now you have to deal with repairments and because it is your own house you need to manage it and it causes more stress do you see how our hearts constantly lie to us even with good gifts instead of being contented and enjoying what we do have now as coming from the Lord yeah so our hearts are busy always making good things into ultimate things always seeking things that are not God and making them into gods putting them in the place of God and they fail us in the end and we wonder why we're so anxious and we're so desperate we're so always heartbroken but here Solomon built for himself houses luxurious gardens and parks planted vineyards and fruits he made a world for himself where he could enjoy whatever he wanted and so what if you had the money to buy lands Build houses for your great-grandchildren with beautiful gardens and a swimming pool. Solomon had it all. He says in verse 7, I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. He had made servants to serve him all the days of his life who could do his laundries and dishes. He didn't need to lift a finger. He could live in comfort and ease. He lived a luxurious life that even the most successful CEO of this world cannot afford. He was the richest of the kings. Notice his wealth. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had gone before me in Jerusalem. My goodness, his father David was rich. And yet here is Solomon, he's saying, uh, verse 8, I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. When you look at the city around you, what it is that you covet so much? The entire city is living for silver and gold and treasures in the place of God making earthly treasures a God thing what would make you feel secure 
successful and happy apart from God. See, our hearts want more money, better paychecks, more clothes, more pachinkos, more video games, more electronics, more computers, new iPhones, new iPads, and so on. And by the time we get the new ones, new ones are being made. They're coming out right next week. And then you go into that latest gadget, iPhone, whatever store it is, and your heart is like that. Lord of the Rings. Precious, precious. Precious, oh, iPhone 11, oh, oh, wow, look at the features, precious, precious. That's the heart of idolatry. An idolatrous heart who makes a God thing out of God-given gifts and good things. Put in the career there, put in your work, put in your money, put in everything, your houses, your treasures, and you turn that into a God thing. It's a precious, precious. It's captivating you and it's eating you from the inside out. And it's robbing and sucking the life out of you because you were not made to worship them. You're made to have your eyes open to the grandeur and the beauty of God under the sun who lives above the sun, who created the sun, the moon, the stars, and the seas. Right? J. Gold, the American millionaire who lived in 1800s, left behind a fortune of $77 million, which was a lot in 1892. When dying upon his dying bed, he said this, and I quote, I suppose I'm the most miserable man on earth. Wealth can even come from God, but if we idolize accomplishments and possessions and we worship them, they cannot deliver what our hearts are longing for. I hope you are hearing the love with which I am speaking to you. Oh, that our souls would be so taken up, caught up by the beauty and the majesty of God. Solomon says, I got singers. Speak of entertainment. Both men and women, can you imagine? He had the best musicians for entertainment. No need to go to karaoke bar. Moreover, he had more concubines, the delight of the sons of men. In other words, concubines mean Solomon could sleep with any woman in his kingdom as a king. He could grab the most beautiful women, pluck them out of their homes, put them in his house, and make them slaves in or concubines. And he could sleep with them. And yet, he found no satisfaction in sex, even with the most beautiful women in his kingdom. See, the most terrifying moments in life are when your deepest desires lets you down. Let me say that again. The most terrifying moments in life are when your deepest desires lets you down because you thought they were going to deliver the ultimate solution and joys to your life and they failed to deliver. Idols always lie to you. They promise you more than they can give you. And so, you remain unfulfilled and you want more and more and more and there is never an ending to it because your heart is so big. God made you for himself. Only God is big enough to fill your deepest longings. And so finally we see the ultimate gain under the sun. So I became great and surpassed all who were with me, who were before me in Jerusalem also my wisdom remained with me, verse 10. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was the reward for my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity, and a striving after the wind. And there was nothing Nothing to be gained under the sun. Verse 12. So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. What can man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. See in verse 9. Solomon surpassed all the kings before him in the city of Jerusalem. He even surpassed his father, King David, by his achievements and his wisdom. But Solomon became increasingly aware that the more he pursued pleasure, 
the less he could find it. He says in verse 10, Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. Does this sound like living in a digitalized world? Because you can open up your iPhone and Google and spend hours scrolling, searching for whatever your eyes desire. He adds, I kept my heart from no pleasure. <laughs> he pursued it all before the age of the internet. Now Solomon did find some measure of joy in his work, right? And he knew there was some measure of joy in a, a sense of being fulfilled over his accomplishments. Even though it was momentary, he says, For my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was the reward. The reward for all my labor. He says, the only reward I get from all my work, hard work, is a sense of pleasure. A sense of pleasure that I did a good job. Do you find pleasure in your work? Or is work hard and draining and exhausting, life-taking? Do you find your work life-giving? God had given Adam to work, uh, a work to accomplish before the fall. But after he sinned, work became very difficult, we see in Genesis 2, 15. And right here, work is both satisfying, right, and frustrating. Verse 10, he says his work is satisfying on the one hand, but it's also frustrating at the same time. He says in verse 11, Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. And so my question to you today, what are the top reasons people hate their jobs? What are the top reasons you hate your job or dislike your job? I know a lot of people suffer from anxiety because of a lost sense of purpose in their work. Because does this sound like what Solomon says here? He says, all his pursuits, when he considered all that his hands had done, he says, striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. What does he mean? He means everything we gain in this life, we will lose them one day, eventually. Life under the sun is short. And when we die, we will not take anything with us. Have you seen any rich man take his possessions to where he went? Absolutely no. Right? We were born naked. We, we go back into the grave naked. Life is short under the sun. When we die, we do not take anything with us where we go. And so my question to you again, what are you chasing after today? Maybe the promotion hasn't come true yet. Maybe one day your skill might not be needed because of the pace of the technological changes. See, Solomon looked for fulfillment in work, comfort from indulgence, right? Confidence from wisdom, satisfaction from sex, security from riches. But all his pursuits felt like trying to fill a bucket list leaking underneath. Trying to fill a bucket list that is leaking underneath. There's nothing wrong, again, by, by, by being a, by ambitious, right? There's nothing wrong in getting a good job, a stable job, stable income. But is that the ultimate thing that you long for in the place of God? Because it won't deliver. It won't deliver. This is what Solomon learned. Solomon saw that all toil in the end is a striving after the wind. He saw this is futile. Striving after the wind. Chasing after the wind is futile. It's tiresome. You cannot run after the wind and win. <laughs> you lose out. You'll tire yourself out. <laughs> it is aimless, he's saying, striving after the wind. Right? Can you see how futile it is to chase after the wind? Because... If we idolize success, that false God will fail to bring us the ultimate joy we long for. So how can we find a way out of this? By admitting with Solomon that life under the sun, a life without God, is meaningless. That life without God as a way to see everything 
is meaningless. Right? Solomon says that we are very unlikely to find satisfaction even if we worked our entire lives. He says in verse 12, For what can man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. What can you do when you come after Solomon with all of his accomplishments and wealth and riches? Only what has already been done. Other kings had come before and after him, but no one was as wise and successful as Solomon was. See, if you, even if you became rich and powerful and successful as he was, let's say in God's providence, Solomon says, nothing is to be gained under the sun. Because one day, life under the sun will come to an end. One day, you will have to face God face to face. A day is coming when we will stand before God to give an account for all that we have done under the sun. Later, Jesus said in Matthew 12, 42. Notice this. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. What a beautiful and powerful word. Solomon was so wise that even the queen of Sheba came to hear Solomon's wisdom. We see that in 2 Chronicles 9, 1 to 12. I was reading, I was mesmerized by how in awe she was of Solomon's wisdom and wealth. She was so in awe of Solomon's wisdom that she became a believer. She ended up praising God. He says, blessed be your God, Solomon. Unlike the religious leaders who opposed Jesus in his day, the queen of Sheba ended up praising God. She became a believer of Yahweh. This is why Jesus' generation would be condemned on judgment day. The queen of Sheba too will rise up. All of those who are dead will rise up. Believer or unbeliever will rise up on judgment day. The queen of Sheba will rise up at the judgment with this generation. And she will condemn that generation, he says. Because they didn't believe in Jesus. He says something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus came from the line of King David, Solomon's father. Unlike Solomon, Jesus paid the, for the penalty for our idolatrous pleasures. He be emptied himself so that we who are empty might be full. Jesus emptied himself on the cross so that we who are empty might be full eternally so that we won't run after vain things so that we won't chase after the wind that we won't strive after the wind that we will finally come to rest in his finished work and have our hearts forever satisfied in him Jesus is far greater than Solomon in wisdom Jesus is far greater than Solomon in riches. Oh, Jesus is a far greater king who left the riches and comforts of heaven for you. He let us, laid aside his wealth to come for you. He became poor for your sake. Right? Jesus came under the sun to rescue us from sin, confusion, and chaos. And so God forgives and accepts you because Jesus took your just condemnation. See, Jesus came to give us a life of meaning under the sun. Even if we lose our lives for His sake, we'll gain eternal rewards. Every religion tries to find God under the sun. But this is also a futile search. Jesus came under the sun to bring us to God. It means life with Jesus is a gift to be enjoyed. Enjoy life with Jesus. Enjoy the little, simple blessings of life. In the normal, everyday rhythms of life. As you drink water, say, thank you, Jesus. Because water is symbolic of the water that He gives, right? Whoever thirsts, come to me and let him drink. Whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Endless satisfaction, boundless treasures of grace awaits you in Jesus Christ. Life under the sun has a new meaning with Jesus. Even your work, 
If you feel like your work is boring, put Jesus into your work. Bring Jesus into your work. Look at your work with new lenses. Even your work can now have a new meaning with Jesus because he gives you new eyes to see everything else. Everything is a point of reference to God. Thank God for the fact that you have a job that you can put bread on your table and not go hungry every day for the bread is symbolic of the body that was broken for you on the cross as we're going to approach the table today. I am the bread of life. Whoever feasts on me shall never hunger and shall never thirst, John chapter 6 says Jesus. Every time you eat food on your table, thank you Jesus. Every time you open that onigiri, say thank you Jesus. And let it, that remind you of the bread that was broken for you, for your eternal satisfaction. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, says Deuteronomy. Every time you eat bread, it reminds you of the true bread, Jesus Christ, and his body that is broken for you. So even your work can now have a new meaning with Jesus. Jesus is the only king who, if you serve him, will not overwork you. <laughs> do, you do your bosses overwork you? Jesus is the only king who, if you serve him, and work for him will not crush you and grind you to the ground. In fact, he will take your burdens away. Jesus emptied himself so that we can find fullness of joy in God. John chapter 15, These things I have spoken to you that, my, that in, in me you may have joy and that your joy may be full, says Jesus. Oh, that you would feast on the words of Christ, the words of the very living God, which you are ignoring and you are running hungry and after, running after things that do not ultimately satisfy because you are missing out on the bread of life every day. Because you're missing out on the true drink that Jesus offers. Life with Jesus will go on beyond the sun. One day life under the sun will cease. One day you will stop breathing away. Bre breathing. Breath will go away from you. You will go beyond the sun to meet with your Savior. Savior. What will you say of him? If he asked you, what did you do with the life that I gave you during the few days of your life? Will you hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master? Or will you be found unfaithful? Oh, that we would be found faithful for Jesus. So when you have Jesus as the greatest treasure of your life, everything else becomes secondary. Solomon's treasure is pointing to Christ as the ultimate treasure. Solomon's wisdom is pointing to Christ as the ultimate wisdom for greater than Solomon is here, says Jesus. Your idolatrous desires slowly begin to lose their grip on you as Jesus becomes more valuable to you day by day. Everything that God gives now is to be received with thanksgiving, with gratitude and with joy. The queen of Sheba came to hear, we'll close with this, he, she came to hear Solomon's wisdom and believed in God. So today, as you hear God's word, trust in Jesus who has taken the condemnation for your sins. If you're not a believer, if your life here on earth is short. Make this day count. Don't let another day pass without embracing Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. I plead with you, your life is not in your hands. You may not see another day tomorrow. It is not guaranteed. Doctors cannot guarantee that for you. No one can. Do you know Jesus? Have you trusted in Him as your Savior and your Lord? Because He has received the just condemnations for your sins. And this is so crucial. Receive Him as your treasure. If you're a believer, you're a Christian, and you've been Core, uh, passing through life, ignoring Christ as your treasure. You believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior who saved you from your sins, but you don't embrace Him as your treasure. I want to encourage you and invite you to do so today. Is Christ your treasure? Receive Him as your treasure because He is. In Him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found, says Colossians. Like Solomon, we too can show Christ to the world 
that He is our wisdom, that He is our treasure, by how we treat and welcome people in our apartments, in our neighborhoods, in our universities and workplaces. And when people see that Christ is our wisdom, that Christ is our treasure, may they also, like Queen Sheba, trust in Him as well.